So I'm Bill Buxton and from Microsoft Research and I just want to talk a little bit about natural user interface. And the main thing I want to talk about is what's the natural in natural user interface? What's it all about? So we've seen Natal, all this gesturing. It's kind of cool. But the first message here is it's not about the technology, it's about the human doing the gesturing. And if it's going to be natural, we have to understand that it's got really a lot to do with very, very fine detailed skills. So let's bring it back to something to really understand writing, or we think we understand. So pretend I'm writing, I'm just, uh, not pretend, I've just finished writing my notes for a thing for Craig Mundy, and, and I'm finished. So here they are, it's on this eight and a half by 11 sheet, all nicely lined out, terrible handwriting, but we think we understand what I wrote, but this isn't what I wrote. So I have a friend, Yves Guillard, and he did this study, and I'm, this is a replication of what he did. Carbon paper on the bottom of the writing surface, with a sheet of paper here. And so that is actually what the carbon paper said I wrote. And what you'll notice when you compare the two, this is way smaller, it's narrower, and it's rotated. Now what this clearly shows is that while I was writing, I was manipulating the paper, rotating it, and sliding it left and right, as well as up and down. So that the zone of comfort for writing is much, much smaller on the surface as writing, even though I've got this larger desk um, cover that it was perfectly available to me. And this is, works all the time. What this says is the gods in the detail, understanding that writing is a bimanual action that requires this coordinated skill of the two hands using different functions, touch and stylus, if you will, gives us a whole different insight on how we write with a pen. And on any endeavor that we set out from writing or things much more complicated where we want to support natural user interface, we have to understand the activity, the intent, and the human capacity at this level, whether that capacity is at the motor sensory level, at the cognitive level, or at the social level. Now, I want to talk about this in a few other devices, how this reflects and can reflect into how we interact with using devices. So let's pretend um, a camera is a mobile uh, device. Well, it is, of course. It's a digital computer. It happens to have light in and pixels out. And notice when I navigate over this document, I can zoom in and out. I can pan left and right and come down and, and examine any part of the document. Everybody knows that. But the other part is I'm looking out and got my eyes closed, and I can still go to the top left, top right, bottom right, bottom left part of the document without looking. That's kind of interesting. So let's contra contrast that with how we navigate on d digital documents. So my colleague Michelle Pau is going to come in and give me a couple of the devices here. There we go, Bill. Now, here we have two um, devices. This is your standard PDA or, or phone, where I have, in this case, a landscape. You know, we're up in the Columbia River, and I can pan around and I can zoom and so on using touch. And this is, seems to be like a pretty cool, fancy, modern way to do things. But I want you to notice, I can't go back to a certain part of that photograph without looking. I can't zoom and pan at the same time, which I could do in the camera. So in this case, um, you notice I, I move around on the display and navigate the photograph in the same way in this virtual landscape as I did with my digital camera. But uh, it, the fact that I can zoom and pan simultaneously using one hand actually is very, very different than in, in the traditional way where we do it with two hands, where I, I use the, the pan, I have to hold the phone with one hand and do the pan and zoom with the other hand. I, I have motor memory, I don't have motor memory, I can zoom and pan simultaneously. Now, that's fine and dandy if I'm doing a virtual photograph like a panorama, but now what if Michelle brings me a document? So now, Instead of a virtual scene, I can come into this web page, and now all of a sudden I can start to read by going left and right, up and down, and navigate that way. And so all of a sudden, what's kind of interesting is I can get around the document in and out and so on with one hand, but now I can potentially come in and touch and do something with my other hand is free. And we're going to demonstrate that now with, with yet another device. So what's interesting here is that the, I've got the menu over top of the map, so you notice, like the crosshairs in a gun, I move it around. So now I can come down to a spot, and I can just push the flag. And you notice I laid the flag down. And I can do other things here, too. Now watch this. I can hit my annotation button here. And now I can do something, because I want to tell you how to get over to, to my office. So I'm going to hit the record button. And I'm going to say something like, OK, this is the building where you're at right now. 
And if you come out here on the 148th and just drive down here and then turn left, you can sort of park right in there and this is where you want to go. And um, the main thing is just don't come into here around building 122. That's not where you want to be. Now, watch. I'm going to say something like, okay, this is the building where you're at right now. And if you come out here on the 148 and just drive down here and then turn left, you can sort of park right in there. And this is where you want to go. And um, the main thing is just don't. Okay, now the main thing here is what I want to the, the key point here is, is that what am I capable of doing? I'm capable of zooming, panning, marking, and speaking all at the same time. This device is capable of capturing all of that. And now all that says that natural UI is that I can now send that to your phone to instruct you how to come. And so it's a whole new type of layering up these multimodalities. It's not about any one of these, speech, gesture, maps, and so on, being natural. It's how they're used together in context for an intent. Now here's the, here's the most important part. Sure that helps us communicate between my laptop or my phone and, and your laptop or your phone. But now think of it this way. At the same time, I'm going to CC your car. So that the message that I sent here goes to your car navigation system. And the natural language understanding parses what I said in the context of the map, which it recognizes and registers with the maps in its database, and then it segments my speech, and then the map, the route I drew, drives the map instead of the algorithms that your navigation system would have given otherwise, and it puts my voice to direct you how to get there. And furthermore, if I left something out, it'll substitute the, the robot voice in the thing to, to flesh out the, the instructions. The point here is that all of a sudden you now see it's not about the speech, it's not about gesture, it's not even about the phone, and it's not even about human-human communication. It's about also this to other devices, the Society of Appliances, the phone to the car, and then the car being able to deliver in the most natural way for the purpose while you're driving how to get where, where you're going, and combining it as the intermediary in the human-human communication. And this Society of Appliances and how these things work together in a natural, seamless way that reduces complexity for the users through the engineers taking on the complexity of how to build these things. That's what we're about. And getting these things right opens up a whole other dimension of how we have technology integrated into our lives. It involves all these hot topics like sensor networks, ambient intelligence, and yes, actually getting on with our lives without technology intruding, but rather being transparent and enhancing our lifestyle and our quality of life.